Now, this morning, I'm going to be speaking to you about the Reformation, as your pastor mentioned, rescuing the gospel. It's really the story of the 1600 Reformation, but tonight, some of you thought to yourselves when you woke up this morning that you weren't going to come back tonight, but you are. <laughs> Take from your mind any hint that you might not return. I'm going to be speaking indeed on rescuing the gospel in America. That isn't in this book. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on that topic and uh, talking about five false gospels coming into the evangelical church. So you want to be here. We'll talk about culture. We'll talk about all of the challenges that we have. I sure hope that you can join us. Now, in addition to this book, let me say that my lovely wife, Rebecca, has also written a book. It's entitled Awesome Bible Verses Every Kid Should Know. It's a, it's a book on Bible doctrine for children. It can be age 6 to 12. For years, she said, the kids know the stories, but they don't know the doctrine. So that also is available, including my book on Islam. And as mentioned, we will be back there following this service and then, of course, be back again tonight. Now, your pastor, God bless him, in the morning service invited me to do a line or two of Billy Graham. How many of you have heard of Billy Graham? Could I see your hands, please? <laughs> All right. Billy Graham, of course, uh, he's going to be 99 years old. First of all, I should have made a remark about Chicago. I do bring you greetings from that city of righteousness, love, and truth, and justice. Now, when we got here yesterday, we noticed how hot it was. And in Chicago, it gets mighty cold. You say, how cold? Well, according to the media, one day in January, it was so cold that some of our politicians were actually seen with their hands in their own pockets. Um, <laughs> Am I going too fast for some of you? <laughs> so uh, just an invitation like Billy Graham might give it, and then uh, we'll go to the message. So this is the way an invitation might sound of a younger Billy Graham 30 or 40 years ago. We'll see how it is. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to come, hundreds of you. You simply get up out of your seats, and I want you to come. And for the many of you who have joined us tonight by television, we'd like to send you some literature. We'd like to send you a book that has been a blessing to tens of thousands of people around the world, written by Pastor Lutza. <laughs> Just write to me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the address you need. Just Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Now until this same time next week, goodbye, and may the Lord bless you real good. <laughs> well, that wasn't uh, my best rendition, but it'll have to do. Thank you so much for being with me on this journey. If you're here as a Catholic, I hope that uh, you know that you are welcomed, and we mean that sincerely. But I also hope that you brought your sense of humor. Because there is a story that when Pope Paul died a number of years ago, he was trying to get into heaven, but his key wouldn't fit the door, and he was very exasperated. A shadowy figure walked by, and the Pope said, I'm the Pope, I have the keys to the kingdom, and my keys don't fit. And the person said, you have to understand, 500 years ago, a guy by the name of Martin Luther came up here and changed the locks. There was nothing in Luther's background to suggest that he was great, born in Eisleben, Germany in about 1483, studying law. And then he's walking one home, home one day and he is struck down by lightning and he calls out and says, help me, Saint Anne, and I shall become a monk in order to save his soul, but more importantly, to fulfill his vow and to do both, suddenly he he was overcome by what is known in German as Anfechtungen. I know that's a big word. You know, I often say that German is the only language in which you can say I love you and it sounds like a threat. You know, ich liebe dich. Really? Should we settle that out in the hall? <laughs> Anfechtungen has to do with a sense of existential despair, guilt, 
depression, a feeling that no matter what he did, God as judge would never receive him, and he was led to despair. And so he enrolls in the monastery there in Erfurt and, and begins the process of salvation. The church had many different opportunities to do that, the disciplines of the church, for example. Because I lead tours to the sites of these places, I've been there in the monastery, hard floor, stone floor. And Luther often slept there without blankets in order to mortify the flesh. He fasted so long that some people thought he might die. And so Luther was led into this kind of despair, always wondering, how can I find peace for my soul? Confession was of some solace to him. But sometimes he confessed his sins up to six hours at a time. Until Staupitz, his confessor, said, Luther, the next time you confess, let it be for some big sin like murder and adultery, but not all these little peccadillos, not all these little sins. But Luther was a better theologian than his contemporaries. He knew that the issue was not whether the sin was big or little, but whether or not it had been confessed and forsaken. Because Luther knew that the smallest smidgen of sin would bar a sinner from a holy God forever. But he reached an impasse. And I want you to think with me about that. Sins, in order to be forgiven, had to be confessed. But if they were not confessed, they were, could not be forgiven. But in order to confess them, he had to remember them all. If they were not remembered, they could not be confessed, and if they were not confessed, they would not be forgiven. So he was led to utter despair. How do I remember them all? When we were in Wittenberg this summer, we discovered that much of this confession was public in the presence of other monks, and Luther would go on and on and on. And then he discovered his problem was even bigger than he realized. Even if he remembered all of his sins, even if he confessed all of his sins, tomorrow was another day and the whole process began again. It was something like mopping up the floor with a faucet running. In Catholic theology, you know, even if you believe the Mass takes care of past sins, tomorrow is a new day with brand new sins and it is an endless process with an uncertain ending. Now, the church had an answer for people like Luther. They said there is the merit of the saints. The merit of the saints was the belief that there was this treasury of merit because some people, some saints had done more good than they'd have needed to enter into heaven, especially the Virgin Mary. And so if you viewed a relic and paid a gift, you would be able to access some of their merit and it would be credited to you. But for Luther, there was no peace. Even going to Rome, a three-month experience of walking there and back and spending time there, he said that if there is a hell, Rome was built on it. No salvation in Rome. Now, there was a new university beginning in the little town of Wittenberg, Germany. The elector Frederick was beginning this, and he was looking for professors. Staupitz said to Luther, you can go over there and teach, and when you are there, why don't you teach the Bible? Luther said, that will be the death of me, and to some extent it was. Luther began to teach the Scriptures, and he gets to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, said Luther, Jesus himself struggled with unfechtungen, with a sense of despair and separation from God. Why did that happen? And he began to realize it was because of him. But then he comes to the book of Romans, and everybody should know that. I always say if you've even been saved just a few years, you should know Luther's experience in the book of Romans. He comes to chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And he comes to other passages in the book of Romans. 
And to the one who does not work but believes him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And Luther comes to these chapters where it talks about the gift of righteousness if you live by faith. Luther said, day and night I pondered the connection between the statement the just shall live by faith and the righteousness and the justice of God until he saw the connection. That if you receive what Jesus has done by faith, there is a righteousness of God, which is an attribute of God, but there's also a righteousness that God gives as a gift to sinners. So Luther said, now it was as if I went through the gates of paradise. Now it didn't matter how high God's standard was, as long as I didn't have to keep that standard, as long as Jesus did it for me. So Luther was now a free man. He discovered that this righteousness is a permanent righteousness. One of the doctrines that he gave up very soon was the doctrine of purgatory. Because you see, purgatory was based on the notion that nobody really dies righteous enough to go to heaven. Oh, maybe some saints, but not people like you and me. And so what you have to do is to go to those fires to be purged until you are pure, and then you can enter heaven. Nobody knew, by the way, how long purgatory was, though the church would say that if you view relics and give a gift, you can have some time off. So Luther gave that up because he says, if I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ, I can go from this life to the next. He didn't say these words, but we sing them, don't we? Clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Luther also realized that um, this meant that everybody who believes receives the same righteousness, and this results in what is known as the priesthood of the believer. You have the same access to God as anyone else because you come to God on the same basis, and now Luther was indeed a free man. Centuries earlier, and thank you for that amen, I appreciate that, I, I discovered this morning that it is still legal uh, for you folks here in Memphis to say amen. So just feel free to say amen whenever you want, and if you don't, I might. So Luther, I'm thinking a century earlier, centuries earlier, the great theologian Augustine said this, Oh God, demand whatever you will, but supply what you demand takes your breath away. God, it doesn't matter how high your standard is as long as you meet it for us. Now, there's an illustration that your pastor probably has given you. Most pastors have used it, and there are different versions of the story. But let me tell you the story. Apparently, a man was speeding, and he wasn't able to pay his ticket. Let's suppose that he was standing before the judge, and the judge said, you owe $100, but the guy had no money in his wallet. So the judge walks off the platform, takes off his robe, comes and stands with the defendant. The judge takes $100 out of his own wallet and lays it on the edge, goes back, puts on his robe, and says to the defendant, you owe money. You owe me $100. Oh, I notice that it has been paid. You go free. That is the gospel. So Luther, thank you. Thank you. Luther comes alive now, and there is a pope ruling in Rome by the name of Pope Leo. Pope Leo was one of the most interesting popes, and he wants to finish St. Peter's. It's the St. Peter's Basilica that you see on the news. There had been a previous one, but it was torn down, and now a new one was being built. The tears had been laid by a previous pope, Pope Julius. Pope Leo wants to finish it, and he needs money. So they begin throughout Europe to sell indulgences. Now, indulgences had previously been sold. They were the remission of the temporal penalties of sin, so you could buy them. But there was a new twist. Now you could buy indulgences not just for yourself, but also for the dead. So men like Tetzel went throughout the cities of Germany giving a sermon saying, here's the cross of Christ. 
with the papal arms. Hear ye, hear ye. Your mother is dead. She's in purgatory and she's saying, but for a few pence you can buy me out of these flames. How hard-hearted are you? And then he had a little jingle which translated from the German is essentially this. As soon as a coin hits the chest, another soul flies to its heavenly rest. The Wittenbergers went to these towns. They came back. They showed Luther indulgences. And this summer, Rebecca and I were in Wittenberg, and there in a museum, we saw the indulgences, some of the indulgences, at least some samples during the time of Luther. And these indulgences were shown to Luther, and some of them even bought indulgences for sins they had not yet committed, but planned to commit. And Luther became angry. He was angry at the abuses, and that's why he walks to the castle church in Germany, and on the door, you've heard it, he nails his 95 theses. And these theses were critical of the church and its corruptions, especially such things as indulgences. Now, he's not the first one who has become uh, upset. There was another man, and I'm going to tell you about him tonight another reformer who predated Luther and his fascinating story. But Luther now has typed these, not typed, but written these indulgences in Latin, intending that they be debated among the intelligentsia of the university. Somebody translates them into German. Gutenberg had invented his printing press the previous century. Now suddenly they are spread throughout Germany and all the Germans are saying, Jawohl, is this yet sight? Yes, it is about time. You know, it's been said that about 90% of the Germans were in favor of Luther and the other 10% were shouting death to the Pope. Now just do the math and you realize that the Pope had some troubles in fact, um, I was telling the folks this morning that recently I read that seven out of six people have trouble with math. But the point is, you really do see that the Reformation now had begun. Uh, let me give you just two of the theses. For example, number 32 says, says this. It says, those who believe that they will be exempt or that they will be fit for heaven because they have bought these indulgences, they shall be damned along with their teachers. I love especially 82, I think it is, that says if the Pope is able to uh, open, open purgatory for money, why doesn't he do it out of sheer love? Well, now the theses were spread throughout Germany. Luther was famous. He enters into a number of debates. And the issue always was this, what is our source of authority? As Luther developed his theology, he came to the conclusion that the Scriptures alone should be the basis of our authority. So those who contested him would say, what about the merit of the saints? And Luther would say, what is your basis? They say, tradition and the Pope. Luther would say, where is it in the Bible? Well, it's not there. Praying to Mary, where is that in the Bible? In fact, praying to the queen of heaven is condemned twice in the book of Jeremiah. She was known as a pagan goddess. So why are you adding on all of these traditions? That was always the issue. Well, the Reformation is beginning and in Europe you have a brand new emperor and his name was Charles V. Charles V is a man from Spain he is a devout Catholic and he wants to kill Luther, which is exactly what you did in those days when you had a heretic. He was supposed to be killed. But he knew he needed the support of the Germans. He needed their support because Islam, the Muslims, the Turks, were circling Vienna hoping to capture the Habsburg Empire. And so he needed the support of the Germans. By the way, tonight I'm going to tell you just a little sliver about Luther and Islam. You may not have known it, but he lived during the days of the Ottoman Empire, and he wrote extensively about Islam. But tonight we're just going to skim the surface, but I'm going to use it to show you something else that is happening. But nonetheless, you see, what happens is Charles therefore says, I want to kill Luther, but I have to have a hearing first. Because after the hearing, I can kill him. 
But, um, but at least I can say, well, I gave him a chance to recant. So the question is, where will it be held? And the answer is Worms, Germany. Now I have to tell you that in German a W sounds like a V, so it is really Worms, Germany. Most Americans don't know that, so they talk about the diet, which is an imperial meeting, the diet of worms. Oh, friend, brother, sister, I don't know what diet you're on, but I'll tell you this, the diet of worms will work. You know, in Chicago, people lost tons of weight, collectively speaking, because we used to be on the cub diet. You only eat when the cubs win. <laughs> but last year and this year, people are gaining weight on the cub diet. I'm sure the news has filtered down here. Well, at any rate, so they meet at Worms. Now, Luther was such a sarcastic guy. He'd have been a delightful dinner partner. In fact, can you imagine, you can actually see there in Wittenberg the table where he held court and the students wrote down everything that he said and, and scholars are still poring over it. Can you imagine somebody writing down everything that you said at a meal and years later they're saying, what did he really say about this and that? Luther was very witty. He said, this shall be my recantation at Worms. Previously, I said that the Pope was the vicar of Christ. I now recant and I say that the Pope is the adversary of Christ and the apostle of the devil. That shall be my recantation at Worms. So he goes to Worms and um, he's asked whether or not these books are his. And he says, yes, will you recant? He said, give me until tomorrow and I'll let you know. And the emperor acceded to that and said, fine, come back tomorrow. Now let me ask you, what would you pray the night before you thought that you'd be martyred? Luther thought full well, if I don't recant, which was in his mind, to not recant, he said, the emperor is going to kill me. What do you pray the day before you expect to be a martyr? Let me read you part of Luther's prayer. Every time I read this, it takes my breath away. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, how terrible is this world. Behold, it opens its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. How weak is the flesh, and Satan how strong. If it is only in the strength of this world that I must put my trust, it's all over. My lost hour is come, my condemnation has been pronounced. Oh God, oh God, help me against all the wisdom of this world. He goes on to say, God, are you dead? No, you can't die, but you're hiding yourself. The prayer goes on to say that when I'm laid there on the pavement, when my body is reduced to ashes, will you be there for me? And now I'm going to tell you something that you ought to know by memory. You know, we often say, oh, we want our kids to grow up with courage. We'll introduce them to courageous people. All of church history divides now, so far as the Reformation, over this event. Luther is asked whether or not these writings are his. He says, yes, he wants to debate them. They say there is no debate. You must answer without horns, without ambiguity, either yes or no. And Luther says these famous words. Unless I am convinced by Scripture or plain reason, for I do not accept the decision of popes and councils because they contradict one another. My conscience is held captive by the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. I cannot and I will not recant. So help me God. Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anders. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. There was a, the room erupted. Luther said, ich bin hindurch, which is in German, I'm out of here. He left the room. He was allowed to go back to his quarters. And the next day, the emperor signs what is known in history as the Edict of Worms. The Edict of Worms says that Luther should be allowed to go back to Wittenberg because the emperor had given him safe conduct to and from Worms. 
But after he's back in Wittenberg, anyone can kill him without reprisal. That's the Edict of Worms. Now I have to tell you that later on the emperor is going to be really upset about the fact that he didn't kill Luther right there. But at the time he did allow Luther to go back home. Now Luther is on his way. He's with a horse and a wagon. Suddenly five men jump out of the ditch and they capture him and they hide him in the Wartburg Castle. These actually were, her, were his friends. These men were the security detail of Luther's prince, the elector, who was siding with Luther against the emperor. And they hid him in the Wartburg Castle so that he wouldn't be killed. There in a room that is about this big, probably as big as your kitchen, maybe a little bigger depending on how, how big your kitchen is, where I've been many times, Luther fought the devil. Oh, by the way, it is said that he fought the devil and he uh, threw an inkwell at him. You've heard that. Luther threw an inkwell at the devil. Well, tour guides used to rub a little bit of soot on the wall because you pay so much to go to Germany. You have these stairs to climb. You want to see where the inkwell landed, don't you? But in his table talks, Luther said, I fought the devil with ink. I don't think he threw an inkwell at the devil. There isn't a devil in the world who'd say, oh, wow, that one almost hit me, that one. It is in that room, after being given a copy of Erasmus's New Testament in Greek, that Luther translated the entire New Testament, not the old, that took the rest of his life and he had help, but he translated the entire New Testament into German, a German that the Germans could actually read and understand in the vernacular. If you want to fight the devil, don't throw an inkwell at him. You know what you do? You give people the living word of God. That's the way you fight the devil. So Luther now is in the Wartburg Castle, and the Reformation, of course, continues. By the way, four years after Worms, he marries Katie. I've lectured on Luther and Katie. It is a fascinating story, and I can't go into it except to say that she was very strong-willed, but she was exactly what Luther needed. And they lived 22 years together, had six children. Fascinating story, but they were both strong-willed. Luther said, in domestic matters, I defer to Katie. Otherwise, I'm led by the Holy Ghost, he said. And, you know, somebody described marriage like this. I think this was something like Luther's marriage. He said, for my birthday, I got a humidifier and a dehumidifier, and I just put them in the same room and let them fight it out. <laughs> so that was Luther. But the Reformation was underway. Let, let's do this for a moment, okay? Let's go to England, for example. In England, during Luther's time, there's a man who is ruling, and his name is none other than... Uh, Henry VIII. Now you've heard about Henry VIII. I love to tell people about Henry VIII. You know, when I speak at a banquet and people think, oh, he's going to speak very long, I often begin by saying, don't worry. Like Henry VIII said to his fifth wife, don't worry, dear, I'm not going to keep you very long. <laughs> Henry VIII was ruling during Luther's time. Luther writes a book showing that there are only two sacraments, not seven, like the church affirmed. Henry VIII writes a response and defends all seven sacraments of the church. Of course, he gets help writing it. And Henry, and, and the Pope says, Henry, you are such a marvelous theologian. I'm going to give you a new designation. From now on, you are going to be called the defender of the faith. And every monarch since in England, including the present queen, is called the defender of the faith of the faith. But let's for a moment go to uh, Geneva. Before we get there, there's a young man studying in the University of Paris. His name is John Calvin. John Calvin tells us how he was reading Luther, and we don't know if the connection was direct, but he, he gives a testimony on how God overcame his blindness and he believed the gospel. And he writes a book entitled, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. And that book becomes the textbook for much of theology in Europe for 200 years. How do you think that the Dutch Reformed became Reformed and 
and all that. Well, it is really through Calvin, through his writings, and through preaching also. And that was the influence of Calvin. But after Henry dies in England, his daughter Bloody Mary is ruling. She kills 400 Protestants. That's why she has that designation. So there were refugees that went from England to Calvin's Geneva. And in Geneva today, you can actually see where the refugees stayed while they were there. And while they were there, there are a number of scholars that had come from England. And they said, you know what we need? We need a fresh translation of the Bible into English. And so they translate the Bible into English, and that becomes known as the Geneva Bible. And when the pilgrims came across, what did they bring with them? Copies of the Geneva Bible. And by the way, at no extra cost, let me tell you this, Presbyterians, where'd they come from? Well, John Knox studies with Calvin for two years in Geneva, and he goes to Scotland and begins what is known as the Presbyterian Church. But let's continue. There's another reformer in Switzerland, and his name is Zurich. Zurich. <laughs> his name is Swingley in the city of Zurich. And um, Swingley is a very bright man. He, he gets a number of men around him, and he wants to mentor these disciples. These disciples are studying the Scripture, and they come to the conclusion. They say, you know what? Infant baptism isn't in the Bible. We'd like to baptize one another upon profession of faith, even as you saw done this morning in this church. We'd like to do that. But the Zurich City Council says that any person who is baptized upon profession of faith as an adult must be put to death either by fire, by sword, or drowning. Why would the city council say that? Oh, folks, you have to understand history. Infant baptism was, in effect, the glue that held church and state together. It was, um, it was like citizenship in the Holy Roman Empire, this monolithic thing called Christendom. So what the Reformer said, even Melanchthon, Luther's sidekick, said, you know what, if we begin to baptize people because they are genuinely saved, the church is going to be a sect within society and not coextensive with it. It's a long discussion, but the reformers, for love nor money, would not give up the idea of this regional church. So infant baptism was seen, excuse me, adult baptism was seen as a threat to the unity of the empire. And to some extent, they were right, weren't they? Once the genie was out of the bottle, look at all the different denominations you have, though we believe that it's worth it for freedom of religion and all. So, a number of young men, Swingley's disciples, they baptize one another. Felix Mons is taken, and he and his friends, if you were with me in Zurich this summer, I would take you to the exact spot we know exactly where he was put into a little boat, deliberately capsized, and drowning in the deep dark waters of the Lamont River with the voice of his mother, heard above the waves, urging her son to remain true to the faith. Others were also drowned. Now I'm going to tell you something. Anabaptism, as it was called, the rebaptizer, spread like wildfire throughout Germany and Switzerland. And a scholar who spent a year or two there writing a book on the Reformation told me this. More Christians were massacred and put to death because of the issue of being rebaptizers than died in the early centuries of Rome. Amazing. Let me read to you what a chronicler said. After witnessing and knowing of the death of 2,173 of the brethren, he said no human being was able to take out of their hearts what they had experienced. The fire of God burned within them. They would die ten deaths rather than forsake divine truth. They had drunk of the water which is flowing from God's sanctuary, yes, the water of life. The tent they had pitched not here upon earth but in eternity. Skipping to the last lines, the things of this world they counted only as shadows. They were thus drawn unto God that they knew nothing, sought nothing, desired nothing, loved nothing but God alone. Wow. Why should we study church history? 
It helps us to understand the huge price paid for the gospel. Now let me give you some of the lessons. You say, well, Pastor Luther, why should we be interested in the Reformation? I'll tell you. Number one, lesson number one is the power of God's word. I was born into a German home. My parents were Germans. They were actually born in the Ukraine. They came over to Canada and after knowing each other for just about three weeks, they got married. They lived together for 77 years. My father died at 106 and my mother at 103, and I frequently say that I'm sure until my father died, all of their friends in heaven thought that they just didn't make it. You know, they said, <laughs> where are the Lutzers? But the Lutzers made it. They were very godly people, prayed for us. I think I'm still the recipient of prayers prayed years and years ago. But they read to us from the German Bible every morning every morning. One day I opened their Bible and there it says Martin Luther's translation. The impact of Luther's translation unifying Germany, the impact was absolutely huge. And so the power of the word. Do you know what we need in America today? And you know why you're coming out tonight even though you did, some of you didn't realize you were? Is because we need Christians who are willing to say this my conscience is held captive by the word of God. I have put a line in the sand. I'm willing to take the consequences of my obedience to God and I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. That's what we need in America today. Secondly, the priesthood of the believer. We all sang in church this morning. And you didn't realize that we're doing that because of the Reformation. Before Luther, people had chants, Gregorian chant and so forth. Luther said this, if you receive the same righteousness that everybody receives, you're a priest before God. And therefore, number one, it transformed worship. Everybody participate. You worship. Because we're all on equal footing. It changed work. In those days, a good work was what the priest asked you to do. What Luther is saying is, as Paul said, in everything, in word and deed, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, and that is your sacrifice because you are a priest before God. The woman who washes the floor, the man who plows the field, he's worshiping God and bringing an acceptable sacrifice through Jesus Christ. I told the folks this morning this, I have to throw this in, you mothers are going to absolutely love this. Luther said, when a father changes the, the diapers of a baby, God is pleased, not because the kid is clean, but I think maybe because, I mean, the wife is going to be glad that the kid is clean. But he says, it's not because the kid is clean, but if a father is doing this in faith, giving glory to God, and that's an acceptable sacrifice. It, it gave people a sense of dignity and self-worth. We are all priests before God. We come. And so it was absolutely transforming. Number three, freedom of religion. Oh, this is so critical. When Luther said, my conscience is above the Pope and above tradition, he was going against a thousand years of church history. The idea that a single monk could stand there and say, my conscience is above the Pope was unthinkable. Should have been put to death. Wasn't for some reasons we've already emphasized. But, but the point is, now freedom of religion took a while for it to work out in Europe. I once lectured on that and it was not a pretty process It were various steps. But that was the seed of freedom of religion that we enjoy and take for granted today. Number four, courage. And that's why you're coming out tonight. We're going to talk about courage, and you have already made up your mind to be here, so we can skip that. Number five, and perhaps most important, it clarified the issues of the gospel. The issue still is this. How are we saved? Is it by our righteousness, our contribution, or are we saved by the righteousness of somebody else who credits his righteousness to us? That's the issue. 
Uh, let me ask you this. Was Luther saved in the monastery there when he was confessing his sins over and over? No, because he didn't understand the gospel. Millions of people will confess their sins in church today and leave without any assurance that they are permanently accepted by God. Because tomorrow's another day and then another and you work at it. When salvation is totally by grace, through faith, you receive a gift you do not deserve. God, Jesus, got what he didn't deserve, namely our sin. We get what he doesn't deserve, namely his righteousness, and that is the gospel. You know, I fly quite a bit, and sometimes I've flown standby, and you know how that is. You're, you're troubling the woman behind the desk, and she's telling you to sit down, but I'm German. I want to go up there again and just check, you know, does it look as if I'm going to get on? You're uncertain. That's the way many people are when it comes to the gospel in heaven. But how different it is when you have a ticket. I think flying here, I don't know, honey, what it was, but I think maybe um, 11F, something like that. There's a seat reserved for me. When you know Christ as Savior, you have the assurance that there's a room in heaven only you can enter. There's a crown that only you can wear, a place reserved in heaven because you've been redeemed by a Christ who takes you all the way from this life to the next. Amen. And he is trustworthy. Yeah, go ahead and clap for Jesus, would you? You say, well, what is my contribution to salvation? I'll tell you exactly, your sin. Thank you very much. Luther, in effect, put it that way. Oh God, I am thy sin. That's my contribution. But Jesus, thou art my righteousness. And when you see your sin for what it is and you come with your need and come to receive what God has provided, you will be welcomed and you will know that you are saved because now it depends on him and not you. Luther was terrorized by God. And there is terror to God God is a God of terror, but through Christ, he delivers us from the wrath to come because he gets our sin. We get our righteousness. Luther said, you know, my sins no longer belong to me. They belong to Jesus. He was a free man. Thank you for that amen way back there. Now, the terrors of law and of God with me can have nothing to do my Savior's obedience and blood hides all of my sins from view. My name on the palm of his hands, eternity cannot erase. Forever there it stands, a mark of indelible grace. Have you savingly believed on Christ? You could do that even where you are seated. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you that you died for corrupt sinners. Thank you that you died for the ungodly. And we recognize that that is our condition, but you died for us. And today we thank you for a righteousness that we did not work for, nor that we deserve the gift of righteousness through Jesus our Lord. Cause people right now, Lord, we pray to believe on you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.